Welcome, everyone. Thank you for tuning in again, or for those who are, who are tuning in for the first time, thank you as well. This is not to in any way replace our normal gatherings, but until it is safe to, to meet again, uh, we are using the blessing of technology. Uh, let me also remind you um, before we begin to, to make sure as a church to make sure we are calling and texting one another, checking on one another to make sure uh, we're, we're all doing okay. And so with that, uh, let me turn it over to, to Matt to come and lead us in prayer. Lord, you are a good and gracious father to us, your children. You are compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Your mercy knows no end. You are our shelter in the midst of the storm, a very present help in times of trouble. And therefore, we should not fear Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, we can take refuge in the shadow of your wings. You have given us your Holy Spirit to guard and to keep us, a guarantee of our inheritance on the last day. We may now be grieved by various trials, but you have called them necessary so that the tested genuineness of our faith may result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ and its outcome, the salvation of our souls. So, Father, forgive us for surrendering to stress and anxiety, for being dissatisfied with our circumstances when ultimately we know they come from your sovereign hand. So often we find ourselves complaining about the thorns we encounter in this life while failing to thank you for the roses. And this morning we're reminded once again of the freedom we've had here to simply worship you and proclaim your word openly without restrictions or fear of consequences. We don't always appreciate or look forward to gathering together this day like we should. We even find ourselves reflecting on the blessings of basic necessities like food and hygiene as we've been forced to consider how easily these things can be taken away at any moment. But ultimately, we know our security is not found in this world. It is only the forgiveness we find in the gospel of your Son that can truly satisfy. You suffered more than anyone who ever lived in order to reconcile us to a holy God whose wrath we deserved, so that instead you can give us grace. And by your wounds we are healed despite the corruption and frailty of our mortal bodies. Lord, we lift up to you the members of our congregation, as well as believers everywhere who have been affected by this ongoing pandemic. Your plan is perfect, no matter what any prediction or media outlet says. We also pray for those struggling with sickness or caring for family members during this time, along with so many who've been impacted financially and otherwise by these events. For those with immediate needs that have yet to be met, I pray that they will reach out so we can bear one another's burdens as we're commanded in Scripture. We pray for those who have upcoming medical procedures and tests for their peace of heart and mind. We pray and thank you for those involved in health care and public safety and for politicians, including our president and elected officials in state, county, and local government. We ask that as we rightfully respect and biblically submit ourselves to their authority, they will see your people as a light shining in this dark place, that our character and love for one another and for others set us apart from the world. We ask that you destroy any inkling of unbelief in us, any lack of faith and prideful tendencies towards selfish living, and instead help us to be killing sin in our lives all the more as we see the day approaching when this world will be done away with. May this time serve as an opportunity for evangelism, for our families, friends, neighbors, and coworkers. And above all, may we be strong in you and the power of your might, rooted in the firm foundation of Christ, our rock and redeemer. 
We believe that you submit us to hardship so we might see our need for you more and persevere by resting in your grace on us. Help us to do that now and be with us in this hour as we seek to honor and glorify you as a body united by this common bond. Change us, sanctify us, set our eyes on you, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, if you will turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1, we will be reading verses 40 through 45. Mark chapter 1, verses 40 through 45. Let's begin. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, if you, will you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said, said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about about it and to speak and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town but was out in desolate places, and people were coming to him from every quarter. As we have watched events of the coronavirus pandemic unfold this week, we have seen the great sacrifice that our healthcare professionals are making. In Italy, for instance, one of the hardest hit countries, 24 doctors have died from the coronavirus that They acquired through caring for patients. In our own country, we've seen reports of a shortage of protective clothing for doctors and nurses treating coronavirus patients. They are working long hours under extreme pressures. These folks are to be heralded for their work and selflessness. But still, having said that, I don't think any of these workers, including the ones who died, believed that their sacrifice was an absolute death sentence. As heroic as it was or is, there is still a chance of survival even if they acquired the dreaded virus. But today's passage involves a sacrifice that was a guaranteed death. In fact, we even have another word for it and its purpose, and that is substitution. We are coming to a close today of the first chapter of Mark's gospel. The whole chapter is essentially an overview of what what we will see in Jesus' ministry, who he is, what he came to accomplish, and what it means to follow him. And today adds one more little piece to that overall picture. Well, it's a big piece at the heart of what he's going to do for us is in the way of substitution. As powerful as Jesus is, what we need most can't be accomplished by Jesus teaching with authority, as we have seen in this chapter. It can't be accomplished by him casting out demons or even healing a person's physical body. We have a need that will cost Jesus far more than that. The only way our need could be met was through a substitution. Jesus had to substitute himself for us to save us. And the good news for us is that he was willing to do so out of great compassion for us. So this morning, we want to look more deeply at this substitution by looking more at the need for it and then the will Jesus had to do it. So we have the need of man 
and the will of God. The need of man and the will of God. So we begin this morning with the need. In verse 40, it says, A leper came to him, to Jesus, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. The immediate need before us is a man with leprosy. Leprosy was very widespread in the first century of Palestine, according to Bible commentator J.R. Edwards. He confirms this by the number of cases seen in the gospel writings, as well as the amount written about it in Jewish religious writings. According to the Holman Bible Dictionary, leprosy was a generic term applied to a variety of skin disorders from psoriasis to true leprosy. Its symptoms range from white patches on the skin to running sores to the loss of digits on the fingers and toes. So it was, first of all, something terrible to go through from, for, for physical reasons. But on top of that, it was horrible for religious reasons. In Judaism, a diagnosis by the priest uh, for leprosy rendered a person unclean and unable to come before God in worship. You see, in the beginning, when God created the world, there was no disease, no sickness, and no death. Those things entered as part of God's judgment on the whole world due to man's sin. With the first sin of Adam, all mankind inherited from Adam both their sinful nature and the physical judgment of sin, uh, the physical judgment of sin like death and disease. And so all the physical ailments or imperfections that we see in our world are a result of the effects of sin. And so a person with something like leprosy was not allowed to come near the temple to worship God due to the unholiness it represented. Unclean meant unholy. Now, now some Jews believe leprosy to be a result of the leper's own sin. But there are uh, examples of people in the Old Testament who didn't seem to get leprosy due to a particular sin, like Naaman, the, the Syrian military captain uh, that came to the prophet Elisha for healing in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. But regardless, it was still a symbol of the sin of man as a whole. And then finally, on top of that, it was considered contagious. So it was a horrible disease for social reasons. Everyone who had leprosy were required to separate themselves from society. And according to Leviticus 13, they were required to tear their clothes, let their hair, the hair of their head, hang loose and cover their face up to their nose and cry out, unclean, unclean to warn people to stay away. It's ironic how I preach through books of the Bible. That's what we do here at Southside, expositional preaching. And so we preach through books of the Bible. And because of that, I do not choose the passage that I'm going to preach on next. We just preach on whatever comes next. And yet so many times the subject matter goes right with something that we are going through in the life of our church. The many victims of COVID-19 have to be isolated from everyone as well. One Italian doctor said one of the hardest parts of what he, he has to do is to watch patients die all alone because of the infectious nature of their sickness. And it was the same in Jesus' day. And so this man was in great need, physically, religiously, and socially. And so in desperation, he makes a risky move and approaches Jesus and begs him to heal him. And Jesus does. He has has pity on him and and heals him. And, And we'll say more about that in a minute. But notice what Jesus does next. In verses 43 and 44, it says, Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. The showing yourself to the priest was part of 
the commands of Leviticus 14 for a leper who has been healed to be reinstated to society and worship. The priest had to sign off on it and confirm that he was now clean, and the leper had to offer some sacrifices once the priest approved it. The other command from Jesus here is that, is that ongoing theme throughout Mark where Jesus is commanding people not to tell others about what he's done for them because being a popular miracle worker isn't why he came. He came to die as someone despised and rejected for, for, for sinners. And so Mark records Jesus telling people not to say anything. He doesn't want masses of people following for the wrong reasons. But the point is what the leper does then in verse 45. In response to Jesus' command, it says, But he went out and began to talk freely about it and spread the news. And that then leads to adverse effects on Jesus. So the point is that after this man was miraculously healed and saved from a life of misery and loneliness, he goes out and immediately disobeys Jesus' command. But, you know, obviously I understand, you know, he's, he's, he's probably very excited in what's happened for him. Uh, he wants to share it. Obvi- that's obvious. Who wouldn't? But, but wouldn't you think, even if he didn't fully understand why, that he could adhere to the instructions of the man he owed everything to. It's the one restriction Jesus put on him. He was free to, to go live, live his life and, and enjoy it again, but just don't broadcast how it happened. Give credit to God, certainly, but just not specifically the man Jesus. This is a clear example of our need, folks. Since the first sin of Adam, man has been about himself. That leper's joy essentially was more important to him than the one who gave him that joy. And that is what is common in all people. That's why we can't find toilet paper. That's why the shelves of the grocery stores are always half empty. That's why there's price gouging. That's why guns and ammo are selling like hotcakes. That's why the government has to establish orders for people to stay in their homes. Because at the end of the day, when push comes to shove, it's going to be about me. That's man's, that, that man's leprosy was a physical representation of the uncleanness of not only his heart, but everyone's heart. And just like leprosy was incurable in Jesus' day, so is sin in our day. We have an incurable disease, our sin. And so what we find in this passage is that the cure to our need is Jesus as our substitute. And what is particularly emphasized is his will to do so. Again, going back to verse 40, we see this leper approach Jesus. The language is dramatic here. He implores Jesus by kneeling and begging him. Again, this is a way out, this is, this is way out of the norm. Lepers knew their place in society, but this man was desperate, desperate to get out of his life of perpetual isolation from everyone, especially when he knows that the one who could do something about it is right there, right there. But the million-dollar question was, would he? Would he? So that's, that's how he puts it to him. If you will, you can make me clean. That really is the million-dollar question, isn't it? Just like that leper knew the power Jesus possessed, most of us have an understanding of God's power, that he can do what he wants to do. The question is, Will he? Will he? Does he want to? The way we often pose the question is a little different, though. In in difficult times, we may ask, why does God allow this to happen? Why doesn't he do something about it? 
The question assumes God can do something about it. At, at, at least we want to believe that, right? I mean, who wants to believe in a God who is not able to answer our prayers, to come to us in our time of need? So the question is, will he? Does he want to? And so you see, folks, then the question comes down at that point to his goodness, his compassion. Does he love me enough to do something about it? Does he care enough to do something about it? Or, or have I perhaps displeased him in such a way that he won't help me? Those are the questions we struggle with. And so what, so what comes next in verse 41 is extremely significant. It says in the ESV, the English Standard Version, that he was moved with pity. Now, some, some translations say compassion, but actually, the oldest Greek manuscripts, that's what the New Testament was written in, originally in Greek, and <coughs> the, the oldest manuscripts that have been found with this verse actually is worded that he became angry. He became angry. Now, how, how would that make sense? Well, uh, for example, in Judges 10, verse 16, when Israel is being harassed, by their enemies, it says, God became indignant over the misery of Israel. In other words, God became angry at the affliction of his people, even though it was a result of his own judgment on them for their own sin. And as parents, we, we can know this feeling when, when out of love for our children, we can literally get angry at their situation, even if they are the cause of it. We just want so much more for them. We want so much better for them. And so here in Mark 1, 41, this pitiful man, burdened by his disease, cries out to Jesus and says, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus is so moved with compassion that it turns to anger towards his plight. So folks, be encouraged that God wills to help those who come to him, who trust in him. And not just wills it, but is passionate about it. I mean, he, he can get downright angry about it. And so when he doesn't answer your prayers the way you would want, you can trust that it's not because he doesn't care. It's because he's passionate about something else for you. He's working something else for your good that perhaps you can't see right now. But then look at what Jesus does. It says he stretched out his hand and touched. In, in the original Greek, again, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't say... He, he touched him. It just says he touched. And then said, and then, and then said to him, those next words. Obviously, it's clear who he touched, but, but stopping it at, in the grammar, in the Greek grammar, stopping it at simply he touched seems to put all the emphasis then on the act of touching and the profound act that it was. So there's a couple things here. First, Jesus was looked at as a respected teacher among the Jews, a holy man who could perform miracles, at least in these early stages of his ministry. So why would he touch an unclean man? Doesn't he care about his own holiness? Yes, but you see, the, the unclean can't make Jesus unclean. <laughs> Jesus always makes the unclean clean. And so in verse 42, it says, immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And there's something very practical there, folks. A sinner represented by the unclean doesn't clean themselves up before coming to Jesus. We, we, do, we do nothing to make ourselves acceptable to God before coming to Him. We come to Him out of faith 
that he can heal us. And he cleans us. If you are watching this today and you see your need for salvation, understand you do nothing to make yourself acceptable to God. He makes you acceptable to Him. You come to Him as you are, out of a true sense of your need for Christ, and He does the rest. So perhaps this whole pandemic thing <clears throat> has you a bit freaked out. It's exposed how fragile your life is, your existence, and, and you see your need for Christ. But, but your life is so, at this point, so contradictory to your understanding of God, you, would, you wouldn't know where to start. And the response of Jesus to this leper shows us, you just come. <laughs> you just come. The leper knew he was messed up, and Jesus could fix him. And so he came to Jesus, and Jesus did the rest. So you simply come to Jesus, putting your hope and trust in Him. And by the way, that is, what a, that is what a church is then to be. A hospital where a bunch of sick people have come for healing. That then brings us to, our, to the other aspect of this touching. <clears throat> Often when we touch something, we are, we are seeking to identify with it in some way. <clears throat> Again, often when we touch something, we are seeking to identify with it in some way. In the Old Testament, when a person was sacrificing an animal for his sins at the temple... He was to place his hand on it, acknowledging the, the union between that animal and himself, that this animal was being offered as a substitute for the one offering it. The animal was dying in his place, atoning for his sins. And I believe because of what we see next, Jesus was very much doing the same. But the only difference was that the sacrifice, Jesus, was reaching out and identifying himself with the one being atoned for instead of the other way around. And so we see this played out in, in what happens next. What we see next is Jesus commanding this man sternly not to tell anyone about what he did for him. And then the man goes out and, and goes directly against what Jesus had commanded him. And what is the result? In verse 45, it says, Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places. Do you see what happened there, folks? The substitution of Jesus for that leper is made apparent. Jesus touching him did heal the man, no doubt. But more than anything, he was showing he was willing to identify with that man for his deepest need. Not the healing of leprosy but his greatest uncleanness, the sin of his own heart. And so when, so when the man goes out and sins directly against Jesus' instructions to him, the result is Jesus being cast out of the towns into desolate places like a leper. It's a picture, folks, of what would happen to him, what would happen to Jesus when we come to the end of Mark's gospel. He would be taken out of the city of Jerusalem and crucified on a cross. Like a leper, he was despised and rejected as our sins were placed on him as our substitute. Just like his love <clears throat> for that leper resulted in him being cast out of the towns, so his love for all who would turn to him led, led him to being taken outside the city and crucified on a cross in our place. He was a substitute for us. 
You see, this was the only way for God to save sinners. For us to be saved, the justice of our sin against such a great and holy God had to be met. And so to meet it, God essentially gave himself in his son, gave himself in his son, the son of God, who died in our place, taking his own judgment upon himself so we wouldn't have to. He covered it all. And as Isaiah 53 verse 5 says, by his wounds we are healed. God the Father accepts the sacrifice of his son as full payment. And so then chapter 1 of Mark ends with people still coming to Jesus. Even though he was now having to stay in desolate places, they followed him. But again, <laughs> that also points to, to, to the gospel, what, what, is said, what Jesus says in John 12, 32. Right before he is arrested and taken to be crucified, he says, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. So as a substitute for the leper, he's out in a desolate place, cast out, and people come to him. And that is what he did for us. He was cast out of the city of Jerusalem to be crucified in a desolate place on a cross. But for all of us who come to him, we are forgiven and saved. The story of this leper is that he had a much greater need of healing than just his skin. Unfortunately, that's all people often want and are ready to settle for, just some cosmetic changes in their life. But the disease and the need runs much deeper. In the same way, we are facing a great uh, contagion. We are facing a great contagious disease in our own day. And most people will settle for making it just go away. But what if God is passionately working to meet a much deeper need? God does not enjoy needless suffering as we see in his pity on this leper. But what if he has allowed this suffering in our day to wake us up to our greatest need? For the church, perhaps we have become too complacent. One of the great detriments to the church throughout its history has been prosperity. And our world has experienced it like never before. Perhaps the Lord is allowing some hardship to awaken us to what is supposed to be our first love, Jesus Christ. And for those who are not followers of Christ, perhaps God is being merciful. And instead of allowing you to enter into eternity to bear the judgment of your sins, He has graciously shown you your greatest need, not a vaccine for a novel virus, but the forgiveness of your sins and peace with God. Church members, you know how to reach me during this time to talk further if you need to. But for anyone else listening who wants to know more about Christ and his gospel, you can go to our website or message us on Facebook or call our church office. And we would love to speak further with you. And with that, let's pray. Father, thank you. We praise you for this account of what Christ did for this leper and the deeper meaning it has for us, Father, pointing us to the gospel, showing that our salvation is rooted in the fact that Christ was willing to be our substitute and he bore our sins on the cross for all of us who trust in Christ, we are assured of your complete forgiveness. And we thank you for that, Father. And we, and we, we pray and ask, Lord, you continually remind us as a church of your steadfast love. That he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, 
how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? The reality of the gospel, the reality of the willingness of Christ, the, willing, the willingness of the Father, you, to send your Son. If you would go to that extent, there is nothing you will not do for us. Father, you are faithful, and we can trust you no matter what we are facing in this life, where we're facing the threat of, of being infected or, or uh, finances or just loneliness. Father, we know we can rest in you and that you will ultimately see us through, and that we have an inheritance, a promise of a future that cannot be taken away from us, that will cause all of our sufferings in this life to fade from memory. Thank you, Father. And so for, the, for those who, who don't know you as Savior, who have heard this message this morning, Father, pour out your grace on them. Move in a mighty way in their heart. Help them to see Christ as a far greater treasure than anything this world has to offer. Help them to see the beauty of Christ. Give them grace, Father, to put their trust and their hope in Christ, in Christ alone. So, Father, thank you. We love you. We trust in you. And we pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.